Great, we're live. I'm really excited. Right. Okay. So anybody that joins us in the next couple minutes, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do an audio recording. Uh, so if you have questions, do post them below during uh, the talk that we have today. And if we have time at the end, we will try to answer them. Our good friend Kate joined us. That's nice. Yes. Kate's on. <laughs> Well, welcome to the podcast, Dr. Dyer. I'm so excited to have you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Dyer is a friend of mine. He's my personal chiropractor and acupuncturist. And uh, he has been in uh, his practice for over 13 years. You, you got your Bachelor of Science in Biology twice. Yep. I was reading your bio, your bio and I realized uh, you have two. That's, you must really like it. Well, the second one was on the way to getting my D.C. degree. Right. After five trimesters of a ten-trimester program, they just give you another bachelor's degree. Well, hey, there you go. That <laughs> works. Wonderful. It looks impressive on your... <laughs> Thank you. Um, he's also a doctor of chiropractic and acupuncture as well. He's committed to bringing safe, effective, non-drug care to all those who seek his services. He works in... Uh, is it Centerville or Kettering? Is it technically... It's, yeah, it's Washington Township, so it's kind of both. It's yeah. really Centerville, but... Okay, at Take-Two Healthcare. So he works as a chiropractor, nutritionist, acupuncturist. That's it. And that's it. All that's right, it. yeah. So <laughs> that's plenty. That's, that's plenty. All. That's all. Um, yeah. So I've known you for a little over five years. Nice. And um, so I'd like everyone else to get to know you. Can you share a little bit about um, who you are and how you, your educational journey, how you ended up with the practice that you have and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Kylie, I'm happy to be here. Um, I began uh, my undergrad in Wisconsin, so I'm from Wisconsin, and I did four years of undergraduate work, my first bachelor's of science in <laughs> biology at Carroll College while I was playing soccer for four years. That was a blast. Then I moved on to National University, which is in Lombard, Illinois, just out west of Chicago, and that's where I did my four years of chiropractic school training. And then as I was kind of getting towards the latter half of that, I was meeting some other doctors in the community that were encouraging me to, to broaden my, I guess, educational background, but broaden my toolbox so that I could help more people. And in, in doing that and in learning about that, that's when I started to study acupuncture. Okay. And so that... Well, tell me about the first experience you had with a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner. Oh, for, for yeah, me? For yeah, you. for me. Yeah, that was great. Um, so that was actually towards the end of chiropractic college. I, I had actually a rib muscle dancing at our graduation <laughs> so it was it's there was some wild dancing <laughs> you have some moves but, but yeah. I had a rib muscle injury and and I thought I was having a heart attack and so I the party ends and I go back home to Wisconsin I go to my dad's cardiologist in in Appleton and he checks me out normal EKG no problems and he just basically sends me on my way says you're young and healthy or crazy for even coming in and mm -hmm. uh, have a good day well, my girlfriend at the time takes me to a Chinese medicine practitioner in Chinatown in Chicago, mm -hmm. Dr. Lisa Lau. She's amazing. She's still in practice, phenomenal practitioner. But she, she takes my pulse, she looks at my tongue, and she tells me with very little English. I mean, I understood what she wanted me to do, but she said, I'm going to go in the back and make you a tea that you're going to take for the That's next five days. That's what you know, it's real. <laughs> I was like, so yeah, okay, raw I'll scorpion. Right and, I mean, just it was amazing. I mean, true traditional Chinese herbs. Yeah. And, and she was back in her apothecary putting it all together for me and, and basically came back and said, told me and my girlfriend at the time, she said, um, I think you have a rib muscle problem. Mm. And, and she didn't get into the real diagnostics of it, but she didn't need to because it, it alleviated my worry that this was a heart related issue. And I knew deep down it wasn't, but you still, you're having pain like that. Right. You come through all this stress and think, man, my heart, my heart, my heart. Well, three days later, I drink this Chinese tea, and I'm good to go. Wow. So I, I was pretty much sold. Do you know what was in it? Do you have any idea? No. Not a clue. <laughs> Not a clue. Nor did does it, it matter. Did it probably taste awful? It? Oh, it was brutal. <laughs> yeah. Worst tea I've ever drank in my life. Yeah. But it was very helpful. There you go. And I would do it again if I had. That's amazing. So that was kind of your introduction into the Eastern side of things a little bit. For sure. And did that, she was also an acupuncturist or how did you sort of go from chiropractic into acupuncture? Yeah, she was an acupuncturist too, <laughs> but I, I actually never saw her for acupuncture treatments. Um, but the way I got involved in acupuncture was through um, a, a job that I had out in the Western Burbs when I was finishing school. I was working in a golf specific clinic, which is another one of my passions. But I, I was working with these high-end individuals that were training all the time to make their golf games better. 
And as a part of that practice, there was a Filipino medical doctor that rotated through every Friday, and he provided all the acupuncture services in that clinic. Okay. And I spent hours, well, hours standing around talking to him while I should have been working. I was standing around talking to him about what he's doing it's interesting. and how it yeah. works. And then he kind of motivated me to begin more course work. I'd already taken 100 hours at that point. Um, but then actually upon moving to Ohio and, and starting my practice here in 2005, there was not yet a scope of practice that governed chiropractors who wished to practice acupuncture in Ohio. Oh. That, that didn't come in until 2008. Okay. So then in, when that was all coming down from the changes in government, um, then in 2008 and 2009, I took another 200 hours of coursework in acupuncture, which I needed for Ohio licensing purposes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I've okay. been practicing it since late 2009. Okay, that's pretty cool. It's been fun. Really fun. <laughs> that's neat. So, um, you would pretty typically be considered a Western practitioner. You run functional lab testing, blood mm -hmm. testing. You do chiropractic, which is pretty recognized, I'd say, yeah. over here. Um, but so you we're all hoping for it to be more recognized, right? Yeah, it, it is. It is. Yeah, some people do still call it quackery, right? Yeah, <laughs> but, we do. but we're trying to fight that here. <laughs> we are fighting that we're fighting every that. day. We fight. Yeah. That. So um, then you, you, you do blend a little bit of this Eastern uh, practice of acupuncture into your uh, business. So what's kind of your perspective of blending the two? How, does, how do they work together to help your clients? And what's the benefit kind of of, of, of having the utility to use all of those approaches? Yeah, I think, I'm uh, just going to look at my notes here really fast, but what you, yeah, what you say is really cool in that there is a natural blend between chiropractic and functional medicine and the ancient Chinese art of acupuncture. I mean, you can utilize those two in a, a dual-pronged approach or a tri-pronged approach, however you want to say it, because the foundation, I think, and, and you, I know you'll vouch for this, the foundation is always the nutritional aspect. If you can correct that, you can fix a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But then if you if you get the energy aligned from an acupuncture standpoint, and I know when some people watching this are thinking, oh, now they're not talking about energy. <laughs> I worked really, on East, East, this East really, West. This is what we're talking about it's today. really far out there stuff. But, <laughs> so the Chinese word for energy is qi, and it's spelled Q-I or C-H-I. But that's an important word to know because when you read a book like The Web That Has No Weaver or another introductory text, mm -hmm. and you keep seeing this word qi, and, and you don't have a basic understanding of what that means, then you can't build on that knowledge. Mm -hmm. So qi is everything from an acupuncture standpoint. And, and when I spent six months in California working, we had acupuncturists in our clinic every day out there. And uh, she was great, Yvonne, she was awesome. But her, her license plate, and this is a little deviation, but it tells you how important qi is in Chinese medicine. Her license plate said qi mover. That was her license plate, okay, qi yeah. mover. Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you really get to the root of what acupuncture does, it's an energy movement technique. Mm -hmm. And so that can be utilized to help women with fertility problems. That can be utilized to help and those that can't control their blood sugar properly. Mm -hmm. and, and again, that goes back to diet and exercise and all these other aspects that we're talking Whole about. lifestyle but, approach. Yeah, and, and when you couple that in, including the acupuncture piece, uh, the results can be tremendous. Uh, and I've got a couple of good cases that we'll talk about in a minute. But. Yeah, that's really cool. So um, you explained chi a little bit. Um, can you briefly touch on what yin and yang are? Cause that, that really gets into the woo, right? Like yeah. <laughs> in America, at least we kind of think, oh, yin and yang, that's, that's very, very Eastern in our thought process. But as I was going through the book, uh, he actually let me borrow this book. It's called The Web That Has No Weaver. And it's a really great introduction into understanding Chinese medicine. It's, it's really clear. It gives really great descriptions. And one of the things they talk about is yin cannot exist separate from yang. You need both. There's mm -hmm. kind of this uh, struggle between the two, this balance between the two, and it's in literally everything, every part of your body, everything you do. So can you kind of touch on, on that and how, how might that affect what you do as well? Yeah, so the yin and yang concept is, I mean, even a lot deeper than qi, just in terms of the, the philosophy behind it. But if you looked at, I mean, just an average household item, a chair. You could technically describe the yin and yang aspects of the chair. Mm -hmm. Now, to transfer that over to the body, <laughs> it gets complicated. A little more challenging. Really quickly. But yeah, so, so yin and yang, there are yin organs, mm -hmm. just like there are yin 
meridians, mm -hmm. and there are yang organs, just like there are yang meridians. And, and yin the, is, is usually more soft, and yang is harder. Yes, the yin the, is the internal, the deep, uh, full aspects like the liver. The liver is a yin organ filled with energy. It's this storehouse for blood, and it's this movement of substances throughout the body. And the yang are the hollow organs, so the, the large and small intestine. Um, and there are other examples, but there's ways to treat in acupuncture that really focus specifically on utilizing those yin organs and yin meridians. And there's a very distinct separation between the meridians and the organs. Mm -hmm. Even though the meridians are named after the organs. And the meridians are these pathways that run along your body. Good point, yes. <laughs> so if you've ever walked into a... That's why you can like prick your foot and it affects something up here, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's why it's different, yeah. That's right. The, the, the use of a distal point. So for example, liver three, which is found in between the first and second toe on the top surface of the foot. That liver three point has a distal reflection in how the ears and the sinuses work. Mm. So we can need a liver three, actually it's part of a, a migraine protocol too. So, so the... You have to understand the aspect of yin and yang to make sense of your point prescriptions. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to pick the points according to the person's problem mm. if you expect to impart change quickly. Otherwise, you just treat the same points on everybody and eventually they'll get better. Yeah. But that's not the way it um, is. When I came in, you looked at my tongue. Yes. And uh, can you just touch on what you're looking for and, and just maybe a brief, like what, what, what information does that give you when you look at people's tongues? Yeah, okay, so let's do it for the camera. Oh, oh great, here we go. Stick your tongue out really right, nice and on. far. <clears throat> and we'll, 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 yeah, we'll walk through it. We'll walk through it. So show them your tongue. Okay, yeah, that looks pretty good. Now let me see it. Okay, yeah, perfect. So this is great. This is a great <laughs> illustration. Oh, no. <laughs> no, there's two main things that okay. I see. There's two main things. First, what Ted Kopchuk describes in his Web That Has No Weaver book, if, if you get into the tongue diagnosis section, he'll describe what's called spleen-bitten cheek. And spleen bitten chi is tooth indentions along the side of the tongue. Mm -hmm. And that can be from spleen chi deficiency, and we, we won't get into that part today, but that's a Chinese diagnostic term mm -hmm. that then would allow you to pick points, mm -hmm. spleen six, spleen nine, spleen ten, there are others, that could specifically treat that problem. And spleen chi deficiency is very common in America because we don't sleep enough, we're over caffeinated, mm -hmm. most of us have a lousy diet, and you and I don't, but and Patrick doesn't <laughs> But there's plenty of people, people around us that have a lousy diet. Mm. So spleen chi deficiency is really common in American <laughs> patients. And, and I see that on your tongue. Let me see what my tongue looks like. <laughs> yeah, it looks pretty clean today. Now, I have a big mark in the middle of my tongue from some old, old orthodonture, so that doesn't really mm. count from mm. Chinese medicine. What? Okay, you got to check out. What's Patrick's name? Patrick's looks like? pretty good. He's got uh -huh. a little flat yellow coat from, from what he's drinking, the hot beverage. But Sorry. Uh, oh, that's okay. <laughs> Breathe <laughs> in when you show him your tongue. Yeah, I was trying. I knew it was coming. It wasn't a breath issue. It was just a tongue issue. But, but yeah. the other second finding for Kylene's tongue, that's interesting. Show me that one more time, please. Yeah, so if you look right down the central fissure, so I want Patrick to see this. That middle line right down the center of the tongue, mm -hmm. that's kind of a deep groove. Right. That's a stomach finding stomach Interesting. you could say stomach chi deficiency so but, putting you right on the spot yeah. here can that be correlated to h pylori because i had that finding in a stool test mm. and then right primarily in the stomach bacteria yeah and you know causing inflammation things i'm working on right now could that be related oh uh, certainly related <laughs> I, I i don't think you could see just from the tongue finding that it would automatically be an sure, h pylori sure. finding but but since certainly you know the correlation ever since both of them absolutely there, the correlation absolutely the, for, the, for the, kyleen's uh information i'm good to go yeah you're clear, <laughs> yeah, you're clear. <laughs> that's not a diagnostic you, tool you look good. <laughs> all right <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, so, that's tongue pretty, so it shows a lot, just, just that right there. Yeah, I mean, tongue diagnosis is everything. Actually, I, I just got over being sick last week, and yes, even healthy people get sick, but when I was coughing and... and <laughs> no. A few times coming. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but I, I had actually looked at my own tongue because I was feeling so lousy. I wanted to know what the heck it looked like. And at the very front, there's a heart, there's a little loop at the very front that represents the heart meridian. And then right behind that is the lung meridian. Mm. And it, you can't see this now on my tongue, but last weekend you could. It was bright red. Mm. Just the heart and lung energy was so hot. And, and I was running a fever, That's congestion in my wow. sinuses. I was a mess. This is a really weird question. But 
you would never acupuncture the tongue itself, correct? You'd, you'd use the meridian point somewhere else on the body, I would assume. Yeah, actually, that's true. There, there is a there, <laughs> there are a couple of points underneath the tongue oh, okay. that I've never needled on anyone because it's just not not humane. comfortable. It's not humane. Yeah. And so I, I wouldn't That's like just going do to the it. dentist. Nobody wants to go to the acupuncturist and they say, "I'm going to stick a needle yeah, in your mouth." Right your tongue. <laughs> no, I mean, so so to to that point. Um, I know one of your other questions is, well, what about um, this pricking the thumb to get rid of a sore throat? That, that's your perfect use then is to find a fire point, which I'm pointing to on my thumb here, uh, large intestine 11. Sorry, sorry, not large intestine 11, lung 11. Lung 11 is the point on the distal edge of the thumbnail. And when you bleed that point, you can drain heat from the body so quickly yeah. that you can take care of a sore throat in literally 15 minutes. That's amazing. It's, it's awesome. By the way, I did try that, but you had given uh, me a small needle yes. that, uh, for Keegan, and I, I couldn't get the blood out. I just couldn't make it happen. I was like, come on. <laughs> it's difficult. I'm going to have to practice it. I'm going to have yeah, to practice it's difficult. it. Um, we will work on your technique. Do you have to monitor? I mean, I know you and I, I'm so, I'm so into this. I so want to learn about it. I love education and, and talking to you about it, do you ever find yourself um, doing what you do, having to monitor the speech that you use with different clients? So maybe not using chi and yin and yang, and things, oh, yeah. but keeping it very quote unquote American. <laughs> As you say, I'm, gonna, I'm going to use this point here and this point here, but kind of keeping the, the Eastern side out of it a little bit. Yeah, because most people don't really have a conceptual understanding of what we're doing anyway. Mm -hmm. And they're already coming in, maybe many of them skeptical mm -hmm. on whether or not it's going to work for them. Some people tell me the first time they sit down, I, I don't believe you can help me. And you say, okay, why'd you come in today? Why, why are you here? <laughs> you're, you're their last resort, right? Well, yeah, that's that's a lot of it. But it's that's kind of fun, too. Yeah, Because sure. I already know that uh, they've already had everything else checked and nothing's going to kill them. So now I just have to make them better. <laughs> Nothing's going to kill them. Which is nice. <laughs> uh, but I mean, even, for example, there was a lady last week. She came in and she's had a 10-year history of chronic hip joint dysfunction, we'll call it. Because I asked her three times to bring me her x-rays and she never did. Uh, I wanted to do body acupuncture for a second visit and she refused. So by mm -hmm. the end of me getting all my tools taken from me, I just said, you know, I, I don't... I don't know that I can help you because you're not willing to let me help you. Sure. So there, there are cases like that that just either for whatever reason that person isn't open to acupuncture as a treatment modality mm -hmm. or they've come because their spouse or sister had a good result. And in fact, this lady's sister sent her, but she just wasn't willing to do it. So it was, you know, those, those kind of things happen mm -hmm. in, in all aspects of medicine. I mean, there are people that meet with surgeons every yeah. day that refuse surgery. Sure. So I, I don't take it personally, but... There's you want to help everybody. There's people that go to the dentist and they refuse to brush their teeth. That's right. That's right. Or floss. <laughs> yeah. Or stop drinking coffee. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> all right. So, let's talk about some of the fun stuff. All right. What, um, what are some of the most dramatic results you've seen? Either from chiropractic, acupuncture, either one or maybe one of each. Um, sure. What are some really cool things you've seen results? Uh, yeah, so there's a couple. I, I wrote a few of them down just on, like, larger topics. But I'll, I'll give you a specific case study right off the bat. Um, uh, patient initials were MW, and she came in as after having a hysterectomy surgery, mm -hmm. where one of the nerves, one of the sacral nerves, was nicked during that surgery, mm. and she could not control bladder emptying on her own without Aww. use of catheter device. Aww. And so she was already in her upper forties at the time I met her during that. She was she was already a patient in the clinic, not of mine. And I started doing acupuncture, and I got a call one morning. And she said, "You think you can help my case of neurogenic bladder?" Mm. I said, "Well, first of all, I have to look up neurogenic bladder." Don't <laughs> I don't know everything, and it's okay. <laughs> yeah. but I'll find out for you. That's right. And, and I, I said, "Okay, well, let me look." I mean, I I don't know because I was one, I was brand new into acupuncture, and two, I'd really not ever treated neurogenic bladder before. But yeah. we got an awesome result for this lady. We treated her probably between ten and twelve times, which is kind of a lot, but. Uh, 10 and 12 is a range for what the Chinese literature talks about being a chronic. If you're going to treat a chronic condition with acupuncture, you need 10 to 12 visits to mm -hmm. accomplish that goal. Okay. And so I, I went into it right up front with her saying, you know, I, I don't know if I can help you, but if you can give me 10 to 12 visits, we're going to see. And it was amazing because... She hadn't really made any slow, successive moves towards the better until we got to like treatment eight, treatment nine, she started kind of coming wow. around. And after 12 treatments, she was only having to use the catheter device half 
half of the time. Wow. Mm. Which was really amazing. And, and it wasn't me that did it. I mean, I, I put the points in her, but mm -hmm. it was the, the power of what the Chinese philosophy says on if you pick the right points and you needle them properly. And, and in this case, this, this may be gross for some Facebook listeners, but this, we're using four and a half inch needles. Yeah. And we're dropping them down through sacral frame and little holes in the sacral bone like this, down below the belt line. Mm -hmm. Patient's laying face down. It's not painful, mm -hmm. but after you pinch through the skin, you've got to bury that needle down about three more inches yeah. to get near those nerves yeah. that aren't working properly. Right. And, and another point is when you're doing acupuncture treatments, you're not needling the nerve. Uh -huh. you, your goal is not to go find the nerve and stick a needle in it. Which, if you read the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, when they talk about acupuncture, they, they interview physicians that have clearly never studied acupuncture because that's always that's what they what talk they say, about. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah, you just go find a nerve and stick a needle in it. <laughs> that's not what you do. That's not how you do that. That would be very painful. Well, I why feel they like. don't call me on these <laughs> articles? But, but yeah, so. You need I mean, to be the resource. <laughs> fixing things like neurogenic bladders, I mean, a highly rewarding experience because she literally had no other options. That's amazing. There wasn't a surgery yeah. to fix it, there wasn't a pill to take. And actually, in that span of time, she was really doing great for a number of years, and and some of that has kind of backslid over the years. And now, now she has an implanted device uh, that's a bladder stimulator device. Mm -hmm. So she's relying on some other medical technologies at the moment to, to kind of keep her in good shape, and, and she's doing okay. Um, but she actually, I started this last week, and uh, she's got a problem with one of the leads, one of the battery connection leads oh. from her stimulating device, and so it's not working properly. So now oh. she's talking about having to go back in for like a $25,000 procedure to get this thing connected again. So she, and you're like, come back and see yeah. me, come back and yeah, see me. Yeah, she wasn't overly really thrilled about that, but yeah, that wasn't my imagine. fault. But things like anxiety, depression, uh, treated OCD a number of times. And, and it, when, you, when you say treated OCD, there's a lot of times some really harsh medications that these patients are also yeah, on sure. at the same time. But actually the lady I was working with last fall, 35 years old, able to get off all of her OCD meds, not, not by my account, but with her working with her other doctors that had prescribed the meds. And she was off that for about six, eight weeks. And then she, she knew things weren't totally as good as, they, as she wanted them to be. So she's back on one medication now, but not as harsh of a med as she had been yeah. on before. And the reason they had to take her off was her liver was so inflamed. Wow. She, she wasn't able to break down the medications uh -huh. anymore. So. Sure. It's really, I mean, it's rewarding, it's fun, panic attacks, migraines, I mean, the list is yeah. pretty lengthy, but a lot of um, musculoskeletal complaints mm -hmm. too, I mean, because uh, the practice of chiropractic lends itself to that, of course, sure. neck pain, back pain. What about, uh, um, what about if you have, you know, if you don't have a lot of conditions, you know, what, yeah. what would be, you know, high stress job? Sure. Things like that. I mean, yeah, kind of a maintenance, kind of normal. Like a <laughs> maintenance for, you know, you use an acupuncture for maintenance of life. Sure. Yeah, that's a great. Of life. Maintenance, maintenance of, life. of life. I like that that's term. That's a good yeah. term. That's why I'm here. That's a good Gro term. Can All right, I'm out. Grow the, <laughs> grow the telomeres. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Maintenance how, yeah, maintenance of life. How can we extend life, the telomeres? I, I think that really does lend itself well to acupuncture too. And really just like uh, maintenance chiropractic adjustments, even when you don't feel badly, some people come in and get adjusted once a month just because they want to feel better mm -hmm. or they want to... Um, I will, I will say, once you have gotten it done, you then know what normal feels like. Yep. And it's much easier to say, oh, my back is, is out of whack or right, I need my, right. my elbow adjusted or, you know, whatever it is. And so once you go, you kind of figure that out. For yeah. sure. And then maintenance is like, okay, well, i got to get this done because now it's not right. Well, and to Patrick's point too, I mean, you could absolutely use acupuncture as a, a stress reduction tool, mm -hmm. um, as a, you know, not just a way to treat earaches and headaches and other maladies but just to balance energy flow in your life i mean yeah. a lot i liken it a little bit to, to the practice of yoga or or any kind of uh, meditation yeah like that. middle eastern art of of just getting your energy grounded and, yeah. and being there for what your family roles you are. briefly mentioned this before but just to kind of bring it out for people who maybe are nervous about it yeah does acupuncture hurt well, I mean, that's always a great question because, it, no, no, it doesn't really hurt, but there are specific points that will be more tender than others. Mm -hmm. And and really, some of that's based on how good or how, how lousy the energy flow is in that individual mm -hmm. at that point in time. So if you're feeling a little bit tight in that particular area, it probably needs more work. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Or if, mm -hmm. you, if you've got a headache going and, and we're needling large intestine four, 
which is a headache point, mm -hmm. among other things, and then liver three on top of the foot, those points are likely gonna be tender mm -hmm. because you have a headache right then, yes. and those are the points for headache. Mm -hmm. Just like in, in chiropractic, if you're gonna adjust someone's neck because they've got a neck injury, the neck's gonna yeah. be a little sore. Sure. Like a massage, it, they find points they find that are points. not yeah. That's right. Like that. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I will say, because I, um, I wanted to, to research what he does, I wanted to experience it, I wanted to work on a few things myself, so I got, three acupuncture or maybe four yeah, sessions so. done so. and uh, it was different every time it, it wasn't I wouldn't say painful there were a couple spots that would be more tender but even even in those cases it would eliminate within a few minutes and everything would relax so I don't find it I mean I'm kind of terrified of needles and he made it work you so. did good he, <laughs> he did made good. it work so. I think sometimes people think um, uh, vaccinations IVs you're not talking the needles are not even close no to they're so small they're yeah. so, so 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 small yeah to that point that's a really good point in that when you're when you're going to get a blood test done or a blood draw, that needle has a, a hollow component to it, so it can withdraw fluid from the body. But an acupuncture needle is solid, and when you poke that needle into the body, the body perceives it as an external stimulus and, and actually tries to get out of the way of it. So even some of the structures can move to, to a degree. They can kind of slide out of the way as that's coming in. Yeah. And so, and, and the average thickness of an acupuncture needle is about five to 10 human hairs taped together. So we're talking about really super, tiny, yeah. super thin. They come in all different lengths. They do actually come in different gauges too, so you can get thicker or thinner needles. So if we're doing a lot of work on the face, uh, like yesterday I was working on a guy that has Bell's palsy, and um, working on his face, we have to use smaller, or we don't have to, but it's gentler, more comfortable for the patient yeah. to use a, a needle that's thinner. Because you, you even can do some eye points, right? Not mm -hmm. in the eye, but around the eye to relieve pressure. Mm -hmm. For, for different things? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the point, some of the points in the eye are, are right here in the inner canthus. So they go mm -hmm. in next to the eye, but not, not into the white of the yeah. eye or anything like that, but the skin near it. Um, so that's... Do you, do you have anybody that's brave enough? That's oh, yeah, like I needed that point yesterday. Oh! Yeah, yeah I needed that point yesterday. <laughs> I will say, as much as I believe in this, that would freak me out a little bit. It's, it's actually no different than any other point. Yeah. It's just, you think, you just get nervous you think about it is it, yeah. because you're like, oh, he's going to be right by my eye. Right. And, Actually, I, just a really quick aside, I, I was talking to a lady at Dorothy Lane Market the other day when I was checking out, and um, she, she looked up at me and she said, are you a photographer? And I said, no, I'm a doctor. And she said, oh, okay, great. Well, it's nice to have you as a doctor. She said, what kind of doctor are you? And I said, well, I'm a clinical nutritionist, I'm an acupuncturist, I'm a chiropractor. She said, oh, acupuncture. And so then she honed <laughs> in on acupuncture. She asked me a couple questions, but she said, I've always been very scared of acupuncture. Sure. And I, said, well, I think that's common. Oh, yeah, yeah you bet. And, and I asked her, I said, well, what about it scares you? And she said, well, the needle. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, obviously, but then what else? And, and she didn't really say anything else, but she told me a little background of her condition. She's mm -hmm. had some pretty serious um, immune system issues, but wh when I told her about the needles and how they went in and different blah, 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 a little yeah. quick thing you say when you're checking out of the grocery store, <laughs> I think I think it calmed her fears a little bit, but I'm, I'm anxious to see if she ever calls me. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> At the grocery store, picking up clients. Well, you, know, <laughs> you never know. So you, you briefly touched on this earlier when you talked about eliminating a sore throat mm -hmm. through a, a little pinprick on your thumb. Mm -hmm. What are maybe some other treatments that might be surprising to people? Yeah, a kind of a, in that same vein, there's another, there, so there's a bunch of different points that you can bleed intentionally in the body to. Not leech, just. <laughs> right. But yeah. kind of along those lines. Right, right, right. If you're getting rid of hot blood, in this case, you know, blood that has too much energy in it, if you're getting rid of some of that, you can really impact the way the body feels. So for acute low back pain, I'm pointing on the back of my knee and no one can see that, but there's a little spot in the very back, the soft fleshy area behind your knee, that point is bladder 40. On some other meridians, it's known as bladder 56, but that's a whole different story. The point is bladder 40. And when you needle it for acute low back pain and you actually get blood from that point, you have to find the vein that's engorged and then you have to needle it and you have to get blood out of it, just like you do on the thumb, to have the impact. You can take somebody's 8 out of 10 back pain and drop it down to 1 or 2 wow. in an instant. And you're really just talking about a few drops. Oh yeah, yeah. It's not. It doesn't have to be a gushing flow of blood. Yeah. It has to be yeah, a couple of drops that you wow. wipe away with. Wow, that's so interesting. So on that particular, you know, you treated me for back pain. Mm -hmm. um, would that have been an effective? Yeah, I mean, yes. Your, I mean, your case was a little more complex than that because okay. of some of the soft tissue involvement. Right. Um, it, could it have been helpful to relieve pain that day? Yes. Okay. Would it have fixed the anatomy of that was the problem? 
No. No. So it wasn't a root cause. And just Correct. to clarify, it's... you were seeing in Bennett for chiropractic right. adjustments. Had, had... You hadn't gone in for that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. Yes, yes. And the other, uh, on that same point, there's a protocol that I use a lot called battlefield acupuncture. Okay. And we didn't, we didn't use this on you because you didn't really have acute pain. That, this is what the, the protocol treats. But it's called battlefield acupuncture. And it was there, actually developed by an Air Force flight surgeon, um, which is super, super cool. His name is um, Professor Richard Niemsau. And he's written a bunch of articles about this protocol. But they were using it on guys injured on the battlefield. That they didn't have access to some of these higher narcotic type drugs out in the field. And so they were literally needling these five specific points in the ear. Oh, wow. And then one corresponding point on the other side. Wow. So six points. And they come out of these little tiny, like white plastic, uh, ins we call them inserters. But th the point is, like, or the needle is almost like this little flat nose rings that you see women wearing. Uh -huh. That's what the point looks like. Okay. And so you insert those in the ear, and then the patient can go about their day. I think my mom had that done. She may have, uh -huh. yes. I think because she was traveling and she was like, do I think it was Dr. Marcia, mm -hmm. put all these in her ear to fly. That's right. Because she had some, some back stuff on Yep, that's it. absolutely right. Oh, that's so right. interesting. Mm. And that's another. I'll tell her, it's the battlefield. What is it? Battlefield, battlefield protocol. protocol. <laughs> and, and actually, I use that. She felt like she was in the battlefield. Do you wear a helmet? <laughs> Paint your face. I should. Do it. I yeah. should. But we had, we had a, a new office manager at our, our clinic that um, was bending down and put some files away and, and just kind of messed up a rib. And I, I know you know what that feels like, but she was hurting so much that she couldn't even really, I mean, this is weird as it sounds, she couldn't even talk on the phone and sit in her chair without yeah. just this crazy amount of pain. And so she had already gotten adjusted a few times by Dr. Marchak, and then I, I adjusted her, and then I ran into her one day before lunch. I said, well, how are you feeling? And she said, oh, I'm still hurting a lot. I said, all right, come on in here. So I put the battlefield protocol in her ears, mm. And 20 minutes later, she was good wow. to go. Wow. It, was, it was amazing. There you go. Get some yes. needles in your ear and avoid some, some NSAIDs there. And, right. and, and save your stomach. <laughs> save Think your stomach lining. what we could do for the stomach and livers of oh Montgomery my, County. It's oh, so wow. true. <clears throat> um, speaking of, that's actually a great segue. So um, a lot of the clients that I work with, my focus is primarily gut health, mm -hmm. um, anti-inflammatory processes, um, hormones, things like that. Um, so how can chiropractic adjustments and acupuncture help those two specific areas because one of the reasons um, you know I got the acupuncture is I work with a lot of women that struggle in these areas and I was like well I want to see what I'm gonna recommend for them you know I want to try sure. it first I don't want to be like hey go do something I've never done but I even found it very very helpful so how can um, those two modalities help yeah I think that's a great question that really I mean they lend themselves perfectly to each other in that when you fix the foundational things, which is what you work on from a anti-inflammatory standpoint, from, from a natural perspective, of course, but fixing the right foods for these people and, and getting them off the allergenic foods that they may have. And, and that inherently starts to help correct some of their hormonal things as it's governed by inflammation and other, other pathologies. But when you incorporate chiropractic, you're, you're tapping into a, nervous system energy that essentially controls all the signals in the body, whether that's mm -hmm. pain control or why and how we're perceiving pain or mm -hmm. why and how we feel well, mm -hmm. uh, then, then chiropractic manipulation to the spine can es essentially set someone up for, like you said before, when you know how good you feel, mm -hmm. you want to feel that way all the time. Yeah. And so that's part of it. And then how can acupuncture also help in that? I see a lot of people for uh, hormonal imbalances too in my practice and, and we do some similar things and we do some different things which is great for both of us but when I see someone with hot flashes and other characteristic signs of the perimenopausal change time mm -hmm. um, acupuncture is a great modality to help mm -hmm. govern that energy mm -hmm. so that it can come out and be expressed properly so that we're not getting these aberrant signals of my gosh I get hot and I get mm -hmm. take you know, sweatshirts off and mm -hmm. covers off at night when I'm sleeping and, and all these different things that they have to do to just be comfortable. So right. there's a lot to be said for the balancing of the energy, but on an even deeper root cause from there, getting the foundation right, sure. which is what you do with the food. And yeah. So, um, I'm going to get slightly personal here. Ho hopefully people don't <laughs> this is good. find it awkward. Um, no, Patrick. he does. Yeah. Patrick, <laughs> it's all right. You already know everything about me. Um, so 
Uh, all right, so talking about hormonal imbalances. So mm -hmm. I struggled. So in 2016, I did a physique competition. I didn't have a period for like 84 days. So then for like a year, I was trying to get that back on track, you know. And then within that, sometimes I would have very, very painful PMS. And so my uh, process over the past few years has been uh, working on my gut health, working on my food sensitivities, um, you know, getting certain supplementation in. So I kind of found this little hack for um, my PMS. Now through this, I also got chiropractic and acupuncture, but doing things like, you know, eliminating caffeine 10 to 14 days prior, um, bringing in some fish oil, taking some chase tree, I mean, things, things of that nature, and then kind of just helping your body naturally balance helps tremendously but then also you would actually give me these lower back chiropractic adjustments which helps a lot releases the, the muscular tension and uh as well as i when i went in for the acupuncture you had like this fertility belt uh, uh points that mm -hmm. you would hit the do my the, okay the do my. and uh that that seemed to actually help regulate not only um the ease of it, but also the timing of it, mm -hmm. which is pretty fascinating to me. Well, and, and I think in that aspect, you, if you know and understand anything about chiropractic medicine, that is the spine, the nerve roots that lead from the spine go and innervate all the other structures of the body, whether that's a muscle, a joint, or even internal organs. So if we're talking about female fertility and period regulation and things of that nature, the lumbar spine is essential to giving those organs the right nerve and blood flow mm. so that they can function normally and properly. And when they don't have that, then they start to send those signals back that say, oh, we don't want to do what we're supposed to do. And for 84 days, you're not going to have a period and, and this, this, and this. And so, I mean, that that's a real signal to me as the practitioner to say, well, something's really out of balance mm -hmm. here. Sure. But, and, and you knew that already. But Oh, yeah. I, I needed carbs and fat. <laughs> Yeah, a little more fat would be good. A little less stress <laughs> at that time in particular. Well, because if you you know this, the understanding of the physiology component of estrogen, estrogen is made and stored in fat tissue. And when we lose all our fat tissue yeah. through training or, or working out or whatever yeah. you want to call it, then, then when we lack the fat tissue, we lack estrogen balance, which is what controls the period. And when we don't have that, things get all fouled up. Yeah, yeah. It's one of, uh, one of the things I keep... I really struggle because people want to work out so hard and I finally come to a point in my life where I realize that's not that's not what's important. Taking days off when you're tired is important. Giving yourself that stress relief is important because, you know, your fertility ability is a huge, huge sign of your overall health. Sure. And so when you mess with that and, and things start getting irregulated, it's time to take a step back and... and think about what what's most important really when you're thinking about longevity so yeah absolutely. That's, that's really interesting um okay so i i also wanted to briefly touch on we talked about gut health a little bit and hormonal health and how you know obviously whole life approach we can definitely get benefits from chiropractic and acupuncture as well but a lot of uh women and and kind of hitting with hormonal imbalances um struggle with anxiety so I've personally found in my life that it's directly correlated to my gut health. Sure. And so the healthier that, because you know your neurotransmitters are all regulated there and if you know, if things are inflamed and damaged in your gut lining, your brain's just not gonna work right. Mm -hmm. um, so I have had some situations actually back in uh, 2015 and re only recently by the way was that when you went out to California was it 2000 I knew it I knew it because this all happened you left and I, I fell gone. apart I fell to pieces it was your fault it was your fault could have been yeah I've been I, I really just before. had a panic attack as you left no <laughs> no I actually put this together when I was looking back later um so this hit in 2015 it was what I would consider an extreme extreme panic attack and it lasted for two weeks and I put this together later in 2014, I think it was, I had had treatment for three to four UTI. So I had three to four rounds of antibiotics in the course of about a year. Mm. And I never really put that together until recently. I was like, oh my gosh, no wonder my body was trashed. My microbiome was probably wiped out mm -hmm. after that. So in 2015, I essentially had what I consider a breakdown and poor Patrick you know, was so supportive during that time, even though he thought his wife was going 
totally crazy. But at the time, the doctor... I never thought that. <laughs> you did. You were worried. And the, the doctor I was going uh, to, she just wanted to put me on an antidepressant. I was like, I'm not depressed. That's not the problem. And, you know, coming out of it and knowing what I know now and, and progressing through it and getting healthier and kind of healing my gut, obviously that's gotten less and less and less and improved, improved, improved. But um, you also mentioned working with people with OCD and anxiety. So how can those modalities kind of target that? Well, and, and I think you make a really good point in that you you saw your family doctor and she wanted to put you on antidepressant medication. Yeah, that and was you, not the problem. <laughs> you weren't you weren't going to do it, but think of the countless other Americans yeah. that are in the same boat you're in. Which, along with the antibiotics, in my mind, is a precursor for more depression, oh, yeah. more inflammation, more anxiety. Oh yeah, because long term, when the first listed side effect on an antidepressant medication is suicidal thoughts and depression, yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, because they're giving that drug to impact a change. To the opposite direction and sometimes they get it but many times they don't right and now it becomes a endless cycle of well prozac didn't work for you so now we're going to try elevil and now we're going to try you know this that and the other well future i mean there's there's but where does it come from why don't we you know that's that's what you and i try that's to right. do is like let's dig to the root problem and see why did this happen in the first place how can we help your body do what it's meant to do which is find balance there's something hindering that process when, when that happens yeah and there's a huge aspect of it for people that is there's a mental component, there's an emotional component, there's a food supply component, there's a stress at work, stress at home, stress dealing with older family members, younger family members, however you want to <clears throat> say it. But there's just that balance that the American culture misses out on from a, mm -hmm. from a natural health perspective. Yeah. And no, I'm not talking about American culture other than the way we're geared is there's a pill for every ill. Right. And so if I have this ill, then I need this pill. Right. But that's not always the way it needs to work. And so that's where people end up seeing you or, or myself to, to really get yeah. to the bottom of it. And, yeah. and I think it lends itself really well to, to being treated and abated that way in that if you figure out what the problem is on a so much deeper level, and, and sometimes to the medical doctor's credit, they, they truly don't have time in yeah. their practice to, to actually dig. ask the right questions right. to get to the bottom of the problem. I mean, really, it could be so many things. It could be food sensitivities. It could be a parasite. It could be heavy metal toxicity. Yeah. It could be you're just working out too much and you're way too stressed and you're breaking your body down so your brain's not working right. What's that? I mean, it could be so many different things. If you don't know the patient personally and you don't take the time to kind of dig or run the functional lab testing, which is what we do to kind of figure out where the body's not working right. And that's where I think the big, the big answers lie is yeah. in picking the proper test for that patient and then interpreting those yeah. tests correctly because I mean, even the medical doctors have access to some of these tests they they very rarely run them and and almost always don't get the interpretation right so mm -hmm. it, it well even their uh uh ranges are different than what yeah. we look at mm -hmm. because they have um what would be like an average population but they're seeing a lot of sick people and right. so our averages would be more like um what you're looking for in terms of optimal feel good health yeah so they're much smaller <laughs> ranges right. tighter, <laughs> tighter windows yeah, yeah. but when you get there i mean the, the function of the body goes yeah. way way up um okay so what uh i, I want to ask you this this one one last question so what would you recommend to people uh, that they do, like maybe one key thing that they can do to stop dieting and live their life. This, you know, it can be mental, emotional, food, get some testing done, you know, kind of what's one thing that you really think is key for people? Well, I think really getting, getting food in its most natural state. I mean, if, if we had to boil this down to one bullet point yeah. and, and say, this is it, mm -hmm. then food in its most natural state, I think, I think takes the cake on all of it. No, no pun intended, but uh, the other aspect of that, I think, people, like you said, is get tested yeah. at least once a year mm -hmm. by somebody who's qualified and, and can give you the right interpretation and then actually can give you a treatment plan that can be successful. Yeah. And, and you won't know maybe necessarily going right into it if the treatment plan will be successful. But if you haven't seen any change for the positive in the first couple of months, yeah. then either you're not doing it right or they didn't tell you to do the right thing. Yeah. And, and that's what I think. I, I would totally agree with that. I would also say I think we are lucky in the aspect that the people that come to us are willing to invest in their health because they've probably tried 10 other things first. Mm -hmm. So they're not usually coming to us for lab testing 
when they haven't already, you know, not found answers elsewhere. They're kind of frustrated. So I, I don't want to say I'm, I'm glad the clients that come to us are frustrated, but we're lucky in that it's a new, it's a new option for them that can hopefully help them. Yeah. They've already entered into a new space in their head yeah. to say, I'll try this, anything. This traditional approach is not what's yeah. going to solve my issue. Right. And so by branching out and going a different direction, sometimes the results are really, Yeah, really and good. I mean, who, what doctor gets to tell, and this is one of my steps uh, in that I work with people, what doctor gets to tell them, hey, stress relief is part of your protocol. It's pretty cool, yeah. you know? <laughs> go can, skiing or yeah, go for right? a run. Take or... a vacation if you need to. So, That's right. So uh, where can people find you? I know you have your own radio station and you work out of um, Take-Two Healthcare, so mm -hmm. give yeah. people your information. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm located in a clinic called uh, Take-Two Healthcare. We're on Far Hills Avenue in between Whip and Ron Roads in the Royal Swiss Village. Um, Kind of ironically, we're right behind a Taco Bell. <laughs> Lots of people know But that. also right next to Dorothy Lane Market. So yes, it's yes. balanced, right? Yeah, so if you know where the Dorothy Lane Market is in Washington Square, we're one complex up from there on the same side of the road. Um, and we've been there. I've been practicing with Dr. Margo for 14 years. Wow. And he's been there for, I think, 34, 35 and He's now. the initial... Uh, yeah, he started founded the, the clinic. practice, right? Uh -huh. now. Yep, yep. He founded the clinic. Uh, He's been practicing chiropractic since I was about three or four years old. So I'm, I'm honored and humbled that he chose to have me join his practice when I did right out of school. And That's pretty cool. um, now I've added a couple of other credentials to my background and we just keep running with it. But you can find us on the web too at take2healthcare.com. Uh, you can listen to us on Saturday mornings on WHIO. And it's the number two. Take, yes. The number right. two. Yep. Take, T-A-K-E, the number two, and then healthcare.com. That's our website. Um, on WHIO, W-H-I-O is the radio station that we're on on Saturday mornings from 11 to noon. And uh, we, we put out a monthly newsletter on our website and we do uh, some community lectures here and there for different churches and groups that want to have us come out and talk about what yeah. we do. So that's how you can and find then he me. occasionally does podcasts too. And you can, yeah, you can, follow me, you can follow me online. I have an Instagram account, Dr. Andrew Dyer. I have a Twitter account of Facebook and Take Two Healthcare has a good, great Facebook page as well. Awesome. Thank you, Kylie. Yep. And if, um, so people aren't from here, yep. uh, but they're looking to get some chiropractic treatment or acupuncture, what are maybe some things that they should look for or search for when they're trying to find a quality? My personal recommendation, just to throw this out there, and this would be with any practitioner, medical, functional, chiropractic, whoever, will be to find somebody that you're comfortable with that will listen to you. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so you never feel like you're being told what to do, but it's a conversation. Um, that would be my personal recommendation. But what are some things in terms of looking for someone who's really accredited, knows what they're doing? Yeah, so I, I wrote a few bullet points on this, and I just said, you know, I think their website should make you want to call and ask more. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I know in this day and age, if, if you don't have a web presence, it, I mean, why don't you? That's my question. But <laughs> yeah. you need to have a web presence. Right. I mean, if you're trying to grow an organic business, you have to have a web presence. Yeah. So if you don't have one, get one. But um, it really comes down to getting on their schedule and getting results. But do they have case studies um, on their website that are more than just testimonials? Because sure. I can call Kylene and Patrick and have them put together a really wonderful testimonial, but they may have never actually come to see me. Sure. And so there, there needs to be some documentation of, Here's where they start off. Here's what their tests looked like when they came in. And now here's where they are six months later after following my program. Something like that. And it, chiropractic and acupuncture doesn't always lend itself to that because mm -hmm. it's not as clear cut as functional medicine. Um, but I think that that is one big key is, you know, how does their website look? Does it make you want to call? And then do you have a friendly voice on the other end that's willing yeah. to answer your questions, give you some um estimates on how much it might cost sure. to, to seek their care and then you know board certification is a big plus um, but it's not always required in each state in order to practice acupuncture or nutrition so I have a DABCA which is diplomate from the American Board of Chiropractic Acupuncturists mm -hmm. and that's essentially my chiropractic acupuncture board certification um, it's re not required in the state of Ohio that I have that in okay. order to work with patients but um, you do have to pass the national board exam for acupuncture mm -hmm. in order to practice. Okay. And then if you get this diplomate credential, that just shows that you put in more time, took another examination, yeah. you know, went in front of a peer-reviewed group and, and were basically approved to practice that way. You do have quite a few letters after your name. 
It's starting to get pretty good. It's starting, <laughs> it's starting to get, to get good. It's just starting to get just good. It's starting to get good. <laughs> we got another couple to work on. Well, I don't know. I'm maybe in I, I feel the same. I'm like, what's the next certification I can get? What's the next ed- learning that I can, you know, I want to just keep, I want to keep learning because, you know, every client's going to be different and you want to know enough that you can, if you can't personally help them, you can point them in the right direction, but you have enough skills to hopefully help, you know, everybody that comes to you in one way or another, you know, and, and, and that's I, exciting. It's fun. And I think that comes back too to the, to when you're looking for somebody aside from Kyleen and I that, that do this kind of work, you don't always have to find an elder statesman doctor or functional practitioner, if that's a female or male, the, the sex category is out, out of it. But you don't always have to look for someone that's been around and done it for 30 years. Mm-hmm. Because as my friend, Dr. Gary Eastead always told me when I was first into practice, and I, I would walk into a room with patients and they would say, my God, are you old enough to practice? Oh, well, thank you very <laughs> like, much. like yes. a 20 year old pastor. You're like, oh. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and and he, he always said, when people called his office when he was young, and, and they answered the phone, he would say, well, do you want an old doctor or do you want a good one? Yeah. And not yeah. to say the old doctors aren't good, because many of them are sure. very, very good. Sure. But just because you're young and don't have a ton of clinical experience doesn't mean you're not a good doctor. Right. You, Maybe you're you could, up on the newest stuff. That's right. Absolutely. Maybe you have like all the energy to keep learning, and you're, the, you're getting more letters after your name, you're getting more certifications. That was my whole point, is yeah. that if you continue to pursue advanced yeah. certifications, you can be... Uh, you know, younger than 32 years old and, yeah. and killing it in practice because you've taken the time to invest in your own education right. and now you're helping more people. Yeah. That's the oh, I love it. That's why we're here. Hey, this is fascinating. <laughs> so I hope that you'll come back and do it again. I will. Thank you I so will. much. Thank you. I have absolutely loved talking to you today. You too. Woo-hoo. All right. I know. This is so great. Let's see. I don't think anybody, I was trying to check occasionally. I don't think anybody has any questions, but let's just pop on and take a look. Yes. Are you doing the radio uh, station this morning? No, Dr. Yaley's covering it today, okay. which is really good. That's pretty cool. That's how I get to go shop for golf clubs. Oh, all right. We do <laughs> you get to shop for golf clubs. All uh-huh. right. We do actually have one question here. Oh, good. Yeah. Can acupuncture help dry eye syndrome? Yeah, great question. We're still on the table? Yes. Okay, yes. good. Yeah, so really good question. Uh, I'll give you the long and the short answer. Uh, yes, it can. Uh, but you'll need more than just acupuncture. Um, so you'll need to work with someone like Kyleen or someone like myself that can actually set up the foundational nutritional approach for you too because dry eye syndrome can be caused from uh, different surgical procedures. It can be as a result of a couple of other health concerns. So it may not really be dry eye that's the actual problem, although that's how it feels to you. It's really the body's signal that there's something else not working properly and now your eyes aren't getting lubricated the way they should. So. Yes, I've helped dry eye syndrome with acupuncture, but I think it lends itself even better to a functional nutrition approach uh, and then acupuncture sprinkled in on top of that. Sure. That, that's how I feel about that it. That actually leads to two more questions for me, if you don't mind. Yes, yeah, okay. of course. All right. Um, so my dad has glaucoma. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, I'm obviously very much from, let's try to approach it from a nutrition perspective as much as we can, mm-hmm. do as much as we can naturally to relieve inflammation, relieve pressure. What, um, if anything, can be done from your for glau- perspective? For glaucoma. Uh-huh, for yeah. glaucoma. Glaucoma is Whether it be supplementation. I mean, I know you're in that world as well, and you do the nutrition side, so. Mm-hmm. Glaucoma is a really tough one because <clears throat> depending upon how high the pressures are when the patient comes in, um, they're going to need some kind of medical treatment, maybe. Sure. Maybe. And... There's a lot to be done, even with an, utilizing acupuncture, utilizing functional medicine, supplementation, diet. There's a lot to be done to support the healthy eye uh, function, balance. But glaucoma is really a pressure issue. Mm-hmm. And so some of that lends itself to looking at what the blood pressure is in mm-hmm. the patient's body. And, and, and I have patients with normal blood pressure that have crazy high glaucoma readings and, and vice versa. But excuse me, glaucoma is really a challenge in that you you really have to know a lot more about the patient and how they got there and and what they're willing to do to get better Mm -hmm. Uh, but we can we can have a long conversation about that later (laughs) i think think to to be safe because this is going out there for all to digest i think glaucoma really needs to be dual managed sure there's got to be the multi-pronged approach yeah it's helpful co-management for sure because even my uh, i have a nice (laughs) nice 
she's nice, but she's a very tiny little lady. She's in her upper 60s. She probably weighs 97 pounds, and she's like 5'2", five, 5'3", five, so she's a very, very little person. And you wouldn't think, oh, this is going to be a high blood pressure patient. Yeah. And, and she's not, but she's got glaucoma like crazy. Sure. And she is vehemently opposed to taking any medication of any kind. Oh. Except she... She's to take the eye drops for that. That's right. Which, yeah. And she will do that. Yeah, okay. Because I told her, if you don't do it, you're going to go blind. Right. And, and mm-hmm. so she, she doesn't want that. Yeah. And so it's, you know, of all the conditions out there that I feel really confident in treating, glaucoma is yeah. not high on my list, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. But there's well, still a lot no, to be there, done. There is so much... Um, there are times, I feel like, where you do need... There are certain clients with certain issues that do need the medical and the natural. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes it's the benefit of doing both. Most of the time, I think uh, we can help people prevent getting getting there. You know, yes. that's really the goal is to prevent them to need to get to that point. Um, one yeah. other question, because I've had this done as well, so I'm pulling from my own experience. This is great. I know. Um, we're ta- we've talked a little bit about gut health and stuff. So when people have, uh, you know, digestive issues, sometimes they have pain here. They think it's um, acid reflux, GERD, whatever. A lot of times it's actually because they don't have enough acid. Mm-hmm. Um, occasionally it's because they have too much. Um, you know, talking about what I talk about with the stool testing, maybe they have H. pylori and they're getting some ulcers, stuff like that. Sure. Um, but I've actually come in with some pain there, like, you know, just happened to be on the day or the day before that I was getting acupuncture. And you're like, hey, let me put this little bit of drink in. <laughs> and it's amazing what that little, little bit can do. Um, is that, or is there anything else like uh, on the chiropractic side or anything else that you'd kind of throw out there for people that struggle with that? Cause that's kind of a common mm-hmm. thing I think that people struggle with. Oh yeah. It's a, there's a soft tissue manipulation that I do and I, I did it. Probably. Oh, that's right. I've had that done too. It, it's like you push yeah, and you, pull. You get in there nice and deep. I'll, I can demonstrate on Patrick just briefly, but <laughs> so you find the xiphoid process at the bottom of the sternum and you get your middle finger in there nice and deep and the patient turns their head to the right. And this would be done on a table that's a little bit declined. But basically, my other hand goes over the top of this one, and we traction that tissue down. Okay. And so it's really, it's a soft tissue manipulation for a potential hiatal hernia, which if we get into the nuts and bolts of that just briefly, hiatal hernia is bowel entrapment that happens up above the diaphragm. So mm-hmm. something's happened to the diaphragm. There's been an injury, a rip, or a tear. And now that that digestive tract has actually come up above the diaphragm. Mm-hmm. That's the true definition of hiatal hernia. And oftentimes that's not really a surgical case. The surgeons don't want anything to do with that area. It's a difficult area to get into, make the changes happen, and then mm-hmm. fix and, and see really resolve. But I did that manipulation probably three, four times yesterday. And really? it's a great, yeah. great technique to relieve symptoms of GERD, yeah. hiatal hernia. It does like work. That. I mean, you've, you've used it on me. Oh, I feel fantastic ah! now. <laughs> And so, you should. so you can drink that coffee and get a little, uh, and then he'll just, he'll push it up. Um, but you also do the acupuncture point there yes. as well. Is it the same concept or does it do something a little bit different? Um, I mean, conceptually it's the same. Uh, the stimulation is a lot different, but that uh, this conception vessel 14 is the point at the bottom of the xiphoid process. And it's really to help with anything going on in that central line of the body so that okay. that middle so conception vessel is a meridian that's not dual sided it's only a one meridian channel and it's right down the front middle of the body and then governing vessel is down the middle of the back of the body mm-hmm. so cv14 um, is the point that we're talking about and yeah that point can be stimulated and used to, to help affect that area too huh. so it's really cool yeah it's pretty fun. so you're gonna go now right you're going to go get some acupuncture. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> You're like, I'm not telling you to leave the table. I'm oh, just... <laughs> I wasn't sure if we were sending him off. Or... No, no. All right. Well, thank you yeah. so much. I think thank that's you. it. Awesome. Bye. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>